You're live. Time to get serious, LG. Is it? Kinda. Actually, it's time to not get serious at all. It's time to start goofing off. Got no answer for me. I, I asked her what to, she's like. I don't know what the hell just happened. I don't, I don't know, know what, what you were doing. I don't what I don't know what any of that was about. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Reverend Guitar Circle Our Ranch, where rock happens today. Indeed. Oh, I've got this fun little little bass to talk about here. Uh, as you guys know, as some of you who are watching know, we uh, we made uh, a limited edition uh, Bradford Beach Blue. Um, Gristle 90 to celebrate the launch of the Gristle, the long-awaited launch of the Gristle 90. And uh, tying in with that, our friends over at Wildwood Guitars did a short run of Bradford Beach Blue Sentinel Basses Wildwood. Wildwood has been killing it with the Sentinel Bass. They, uh, they are one of the leading Sentinel Bass dealers, as it were, LG. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that's because uh, ham-handed guitar players like myself um, are comfortable with short scale basses and well, typical with Naylor, of course, he designed a short scale bass that sounds massive. And short scale basses are just trendy. They're popular. Well, yeah, they're popular. Yeah. 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 I don't, don't know. use all That's your fancy why, internet words with us guitar players like here. Like trendy and like popular? Like trending and popular and uh, stuff like okay. that because <laughs> us old tube amp guys, we don't care about that kind of stuff. We're just like, is this cool? That's all we really care about being cool obviously <laughs> it's 
Look at the guy in the gas station t-shirt. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Anyways, Bradford Beach Blue is, uh, is a, a variation of the Reverend Turquoise um, that looks a little bluer than green um, this month. <laughs> Just kidding, kind of. And um, what we have here in the Sentinel, of course, it's transparent. So you can see the Karina grain through the finish of the base. Hold the headstock up towards the sky. There, now you can see it. There you have it. Uh, like all Reverend bases, the, the bridge has a string through or top load option. Uh, we string through the round wounds here in the shop when we're setting them up, um, but often uh, encourage guys playing flats to top load them so they don't have that hard break on that flat wound string. Um, this is, there's an interesting story behind this base. Um, you guys are familiar, obviously, from me talking about it all the time, the Watt Plower. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Mr. Watt, uh, Mr. San Pedro himself, and uh, we do the killer Watt Plower base and the Watt Plower Mark II um, for Watt, and uh, Watt is a short scale player. He played the EBO bases and the Stooges and such uh, before we started working with him, and Joe made a version, uh, jo when Joe designed a short scale base that sounds massive for Mike and balances well and is super lightweight and it's just a killer, killer bass. And that started Joe sort of down a path on the short scale thing and wanting to do um, something for the Reverend production line as well. So when we started doing the Mark II um, a couple of years ago and working on that with Mike, uh, Mike's concept for the Mark II bass is really cool. It's, it's got a whole plethora of pickups underneath of the strings and it's sort of unique switching thing. And if you've probably seen me talk about it on here before, and if you have not, just scroll down into the videos and there's plenty of what right. coverage here. Right. Um, Joe became fascinated with the idea of uh, not exactly replicating, but mimicking the sounds of the Watt Power Mark II bass with just capacitors. Um, so that we wouldn't have all of that sort of hardware on the on the base body, um, and he came up with a very very close approximation of of it. I it's blindfolded. It's tough, uh, but there is more going on um, than just the electronics between the Sentinel and the Watt Plower. Uh, the body shape is our sort of modern uh, modern offset waist body shape with the center ridge. So there is more mass uh, underneath of the strings, of course, and um, the string spacing is more traditional on this than it is on the watt. The, the, the string spacing is a little bit wider between the strings. Watt is the most narrow bridge that we could find. And, um, and then the, the neck joint on the watt plower being a very, very deep double cutaway, most of the neck on the, on the watt base is out from the body, which makes it resonate very, very uh, like mad, right, and leads to a really open tone. Here, with the neck joint on the Sentinel, um, the neck is more connected to the body, for lack of a better term, and so the neck doesn't resonate as much, and it makes for a very, very tighter, more focused tone. And um, it's very, it's somewhat embarrassing for me to play bass on this year's show uh, when Reverend works with so many incredible bass players. And quite frankly, there's three incredible bass players right in here the in the building yeah. uh, with us, with Chris Zielinski and John Zenz and Seth Anderson. But uh, he, this um, this part of the program falls on me. Mm -hmm. uh, but not just those guys, but Andy Irvine, folks, um, if this bass interests you, um, check out Andy Irvine's uh, bass channel. And he has a Mulberry Mist version of the Sentinel, yep. and he loves that bass. Yep. And he has done numerous videos with it um, through better bass gear than I have. I'm not plugged into bass gear at all. There's an Aguilar Tone Hammer 500 over there behind Little Gal, um, but it's not hooked up or mic'd into any of this stuff because this just sort of happened. Um, so I'm actually running the bass through my guitar rig, and it sounds great, by the way, uh, a tribute to this cool car rambler. I'm going to give you the tones on this thing real quick, um, and or maybe, maybe, maybe I won't. <laughs> the, what would be the bridge position, or with the three-way switch closest to the volume control, is uh, Joe's P-Rails pickups wide open. 
and that's a really cool uh, little Stooges thing I had going there. <laughs> And then all the way the other way, hold on Algie, let okay. me get through this and then I'll answer questions. All right. Well, all the way the other way is this sort of muted what would be a neck pickup kind of a vibe where the, the mids are shifted. position it splits the difference. The clarity obviously in the string to string balance is excellent. A better player would show that off a little bit more. Uh, this and of course the shorter scale again is more comfortable for guitar players I think bass players are used to doing this and I, one of the reasons why I think we've been selling so many of these Sentinels this year is because people are stocking up their home studios players of all sorts and uh, want to have good proper gear and this is a very very versatile one pickup bass she's looking at me like I'm crazy what's up LJ Naylor refers to those switches as bright yes uh, bright normal and deep yes Bright, so the, all the way normal, the bridge would be bright. Bright. Normal. And deep. Can you dig it? Yeah. Yes, I can. What's up? That's it. That's what I wanted to say. Oh, nice. Because I, you know... You were going through the sound. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, so, uh, and the Bradford Beach Blues Sentinel is an exclusive for our friends at Wildwood Guitars, who are um, kicking ass and taking names. Note the bound headstock, by the way. I just can't get over all the binding on the headstocks that we're doing, LG. All those set neck guitars have got the cool bound headstocks. Hip shot tuners. This is a Karina body. It is a three piece Karina neck. It is long ways, those three pieces, uh, to give you strength around the headstock so that we do not have to have an ugly volute. This particular instrument features a Powell Ferro fingerboard, a Karina body with a raised center ridge, uh, reverence top loader string through bridge, and uh, it is in Bradford Beach Blue. We are also making the Sentinel uh, currently in Alpine Green, Mulberry Mist, and Black, the Reverend Guitars Sentinel Bass. Although the Mulberry Mist is going away. The Mulberry Mist is going away. So if you're excited about the Mulberry Mist, go ahead and grab yourself one. And of course, the Mulberry Mist is only going away because we need to make room to make all these fun new guitars. Right that we're trying to come out with. And right. things are just super busy and crazy out there. How is everybody doing today, LG? Anybody have fine. any comments, questions, or concerns? I know we get mostly, this is not a bass channel. Yeah. So I'm going outside the box here with this bass to all you guitar guys who are watching me. Thank you all for tuning in every week. Scott Busey yeah. says, Hi. Are there, hey Scott. Yeah, are there any new colors coming on the Billy Corgan ones? The original. There are not, Scott. We um, we are currently in the midst of wrapping up the design on a new Billy Corgan model, which we will be launching in 2022. Uh, when that happens, we are going to be pairing. I'm not going to discontinue the original model because the original model has become um, a reverend classic. And Mr. Corgan, um, it's funny to refer to him as Mr. Corgan because we just call him Billy because he's Billy. He's not Mr. Corgan. He's Billy for crying out loud. Um, Billy, uh, Billy refers to his signature model as the best sounding modern guitar available out there for modern tones, tones that are right now, uh, modern high gay tones using it in digital recording. Um, he is thrilled with that guitar. The reason why we are doing a second guitar with, with Billy is because, um, 
were, were trying to get into that territory of the sounds that he was getting, um, melancholy era type stuff when he was tuned to E flat, and that was sort of the inspiration for what the new guitar is going to be. Um, so as we launch the new guitar, we need to make room for that within our line, and so the original Billy Corgan model is going down to one color, uh, which will be the pearl white, which we feel is sort of the defining color of that guitar. Mm -hmm. We are also going to continue making the Turs in limited numbers. Mm -hmm. Because terse, because nobody makes anything like nobody that. Nobody, and occasionally people are. I, I've had more questions about do you make a short scale guitar in the last month than I think I ever have ever. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was it like four, <laughs> but but still, it, yeah. that's yeah. It, but it's a very unique piece of gear. Something going on there. Yeah, yeah, it's a very unique instrument. It's very cool. Um, Eric Sikama says. I know Mulberry Mist is going away just because you're mean. Not mean. <laughs> and it's not going away on everything. It's not, and it's not going away forever either. I mean, not, none of the changes that you see have to be 100% permanent. You never know when things are going to come back or, or not. We just, we have a tendency to try to be unemotional about it. And so when we have to pare down a color, we just take the one that was selling the least, which is becoming more and more difficult around here it because is. we're selling everything that we make. Right. But we can look at how many back orders we have for certain things if we're offering things in multiple colors, and so we can kind of figure it out that way more inside. Yeah, but that's difficult too because we have dealers that are like, I'll take one of everything, I'll take two of everything. Indeed. You know. That they do. Not a lot of questions today. You must have covered that so well. <laughs> now I'm just going to play Fire Hose. There. <laughs> Sounds good on this thing, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, I yeah. love it. That's, they just get old, uh, my East Sider folks. This one's been my number one for a long time. Cider S prototype, one of the early prototypes. Uh, I've been playing this guitar in the Polka Floyd show for a whole lot of years. Uh, we originally shipped it across the country to our dealer True Tone in Santa Monica where UPS broke it. And <laughs> since then I've broken it once or twice. Jeez. And uh, it's been on um, about I hundreds, hundreds of gigs between the Polka Floyd show, Jane Navarro and the Traders and the Zimmerman Twins. Uh, and I love this guitar. Um, I had my friend uh, Joe at Joe's Music when Scott was working there cut me the black pickguard many, many years ago because I'm into that. And uh, yes, this is a was a stock East Sider S. <laughs> when we started doing the dark roasted maple necks, I got a dark roasted maple neck prototype with a flatwood neck finger board on it. And I put it on here just for fun, um, which is why you've never really seen these cosmetics offered out there in the world. And uh, this one is, has a DiMarzio Area 51 hot telly in the bridge, which I think rips. And because I do all that Heingate stuff on the Polka Floyd show, 
I like to rip that area 51 uh, because I play really, really super loud in that band and in every band and in this room often. Uh, tinnitus also, so folks, wear your earplugs. LG, is there anything else we need to talk about today, or is it I, time to I, go I get lunch? I spoke too soon. Lots oh, of questions. Oh, lots of questions. Lots, okay. lots of questions. Okay, all right. Well, then uh, we're here. Yep. Let's do this. Yep. Yep. I got to find them, though. All right, though. Here she goes. Uh, Scott, who asked about the BC1 colors, yeah, also man. wants to know if the new Corgan will have new rail hammers. Uh, Scott, that is a uh, trade secret. Uh, there is something cool going on there and all will be revealed in time. We're not gonna see, we're not gonna be shipping these guitars for eight months. I don't wanna spill all the beans now. That's true. Plus, yeah. I'm I not mean, really, they will be rail hammers. I'm not really sure what's, what those beans are either at the moment. Right, for sure. I mean, they will be rail hammers. Oh yeah, They're not for be sure. Something else. They're gonna for be sure. rail hammers, but. Yes, 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 yes indeed. Uh, Tim Carnes wants to know if you're playing through the Aguilar rig. Tim, I'm not. I'm actually running that Sentinel bass uh, right through my car rambler, right through my guitar pedal board. Um, it, I find at moderate volumes, I can really hear the difference when I'm switching the basses through this little amp, and so I don't really feel... Plus, I go back and forth playing the guitar, too, and so to set up another mic and rip the bass amp over here from its uh, location, I don't know. I just... I don't want to call it laziness, but... Uh, uh, that is the Aguilar, though, that, that, Tim, you've seen with the Traders. It's the amp that uh, we usually take out when the Traders go on the road. And uh, it's pretty pretty good sounding rig. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. You know? Not everybody can have a cool orange endorsement like my friend Tim Carnes does. Well, that's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, somebody called Battle Napkin. Do it. Battle Napkin? No, do it. Battle Napkin. Yeah, I think that's what's going on here. Right, nice. I like says, that. <laughs> How much variation in color is there in the roast of maple necks? Looking at photos in shops online, and sometimes the necks look pale, and other times they look dark, even though all the specs say roast of maple. Yeah, that's, uh, that comes down to um, the wood, again, that sort of thing. Um, I think the, the density of the maple, um, well, there is a few different things going on here. Penny wants me to point out. Uh, over here on this G uh, GPS model, the Gil Paris guitar has a roasted maple neck, and then the uh, Waz 90 guitar, Jen Wesner's P90 version, next to it has a dark roasted maple neck, and the dark roasted maple neck has a polyferro fingerboard. So don't look at the fingerboards, just look at the headstock. And that is the rough difference between the dark roast and the light roast. And those are fairly average. However, I have seen dark roasted maple necks darker than that one and light roasted maple necks lighter than that one. Yours is darker, I think. Uh, this one's about the same. I think it's just where they're positioned. Okay. But I, I have seen some get, get very, very dark. And I think um, the roasting process, uh, they basically, they, they kiln dry the necks before the necks are cut. And I believe the density of the wood, even if they were to do everything for exactly the same amount of time, um, the density of the wood figures into how much color the wood gets. So they all look slightly different from one another. And um, I've always thought that that was okay. I feel the same way about maple tops, yeah. um, about the Karina wood when you can see the grain through the bodies. Sometimes on our transparent finishes, uh, the, um, the yellow guitars or the natural guitars look a little darker or a little lighter depending on the grain of the wood and I think all of that stuff is really cool. It gives everything its sort of um, unique character. Uh, so uh, there's no real easy answer for that. It's not by design, it's just by... Nature. Nature. Yeah. 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 Natural product made by yeah. humans. Right on. Know. Yep. Yes indeed. Uh, Jansen says, I think I hear a common reverend sound across different scale lengths for six strings and now even this bass. Is that the Karina or do you also design some family resemblance into the pickups? No, I, I think um, I think it's I think you're hearing the Karina. There's Karina has um, the tone of the Karina comes in somewhere between mahogany and alder, I think. Um, it has some of that throaty property of mahogany while having some of that brightness of the alder, and I think it, it is a very distinctive tone, and I think it's one of the things um, that gives us our identity 
at this point. So I think uh, that's probably what you're hearing across the board. And that's a very, very cool observation. I like that. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's the reason why guitars like this one, or like Gil's guitar over there, um, have their own character, even though the construction is, is you know, very, very similar to things that have come before it in the past, and the body shapes are, you know, really similar to things that have come before it in the past. Um, I think you're hearing, you're hearing the Karina thing. And uh, not to discount uh, how great Joe's pickups are, because Joe has a terrific ear for uh, all things electronic. Um, Joe is one of those guys that has the ability to sit down and, and really isolate frequencies, and then, but not only not only have a good ear for it, but physically know what he needs to change within a pickup to move his sound in, in a direct in a different direction, right. which isn't anything that I do or. I, I mean, that's, that's, I think that's a really rare find, even in this industry, where I, a lot of people claim to, to, to do that. You yeah. know, Joe yeah. just, Joe's ear is excellent, which is why he's made so many great products over the years. And it's his point of view, whether we're talking about rail hammers or that's reverend true. pickups or bass pickups, reverend bass pickups or whatever, it's all his yep. kind of worldview coming through. Right. And, in the, and it still, and it comes through on the signature models, which is why the signature guys like him. Too, you know what I mean? I mean, when when he sits down and makes something for somebody, he takes all of the the stuff that they give them and then adds his own twist to it and presents it to them, and you know, with great results. So, just ask Billy. Uh, Glenn says, "What are the benefits of a short scale bass?" <sighs> wow, Glenn, that's a tough one. Um, I mean. Some people say they're punchier, right? Yeah, some people say they're punchier and the, the, the mid-range is a little bit different in them. I'm not a bass player, so I don't want to get, I don't want to really tackle this question in depth. Mm -hmm. um, as a guitar guy, the advantage of the scored scale bass is going to be ease of use. Uh, you, you, it, they're just, the frets are closer together, so it's easier to play. Uh, but uh, if Brad is watching, um, I'm sure Brad has an opinion on this, and Andy Irvine, I'm sure, has an opinion on this as well. Sure. Um, so I'd look in the comments, and you could probably find some, some, some better answers than mine. Uh, Tim Carnes, who was a bass player, who was watching. Yes, of course. Any plans to do Greg's podcast? That's a great question. Um, I'd like to do Greg's podcast from here. We just have to get all traveling stuff moving again. No, not this show. His show. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Okay. Oh, I, I don't have any plans on going to the Orange Room. I haven't been invited. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, we're, he's a busy person, and he has his own shtick going on over there. And um, But maybe when I go to Milwaukee, I know... Polka Floyd already booked Milwaukee for the Paul. Paul. Maybe I head over to Greg's house. <laughs> Do a little polka in the orange room. Uh-huh. It might be kind of fun. Right. I'll work on him. <laughs> <laughs> I really just want to get him back here, man. It's been, you know, years now. Two years. I know. Bullshit. I know. Uh, Sun Lounger 29. Says, Sun Lounger. I don't think that that's what's going it's, on here. It's not as good no. as, what was the other one? Uh, what was it? Battle something. Battle napkin. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> are there any reverence with nitro finish available? There are not, no. Uh, that's, that's not a world that we get in. Um, so nitro is uh, only available in limited quantities in the US, which makes it very, very expensive. Um, it can be found overseas in other areas, but basically nitro is uh, it's 100-year-old paint technology, or 80-year-old paint technology anyway, and um, it's just not a thing for us. Uh, you start getting you start getting into nitro finishes and relicking and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, all that stuff costs money, and I leave that for guys that want to sell three, four, five thousand dollar guitars. I don't want to sell those guitars. And then, and it's from some manufacturers who are very, very prominent, fifteen thousand dollar guitars. It's just not my thing. Um, so, no. What we do do is, do do? Can't say that. Damn it. <laughs> um, we use a poly finish on the guitars and it is very, very thin. 
Um, so the guitars don't feel like they're coated in, in, in candy plastic. You know what I mean? Um, it, it's a very, very thin layer of sealer when, when there is a sealer. I mean, obviously, the transparent finishes, there's no sealer. Um, and then very, very thin layer of paint and thin layer of clear coat. We open ourselves up for tiny finish flaws by applying the paint so thin, but we apply the paint so thin so, you don't, so we're not burying the sound of the wood, the natural tone of the guitar, underneath uh, you know, many, many mills of finish. So often when you hold the guitars up to the light, you will actually see uh, the wood grain of an instrument through even a black or an opaque finish because the finish is so thin and that is what I believe is the important tone difference between a nitro and a poly finish and we have addressed that with the poly finish and having a finish that's more durable at the same time. There you have it. Uh, Cosmos says he likes the Pau Ferro that we use. Mm -hmm. He says the Pau Ferro that other people, starts with an F, yeah. use is not impressive at all. Is there a secret to our Pau Ferro? And also, do we think Rosewood will come back? Um, there is no secret to our Pau Ferro. Uh, we are probably sourcing it in a different place that the F brand is. So maybe it's just the luck of the draw. Maybe the Pau Ferro that, that um, Mir is getting from India, or, or I'm, I'm not sure. I think we it's know, India. we have that information somewhere, but I, I think it's... I think it's India. I think it's India. Yeah. It might be Indonesia. Maybe it's just a, a different thing from Probably. there. I don't know. I know that ours varies in... Uh, it does vary in color a little bit, and of course we get some with wider grain and other stuff. While you're talking about fingerboards, uh, lately we have been getting this really cool figured ebony um, that like we're using on the, the new Greg model and, and some of our other models that looks really, really cool. And people are even sort of confusing it with a Pile Ferro or a, um, a Rosewood. And it's figured, it's like striped ebony. It looks, I think it's fabulous. Yeah, but I it's like anything like that a has a purpley blue thing going yeah, on. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's really cool. This particular guitar, this is from when we were doing Blackwood Tech. So that's what this is. Uh, do I think Rosewood will come back? Yes, I do. Um, I do think Rosewood will come back. I think we're going to get to a point where um, at some point in the future, and this is a bold prediction, bold prediction on my part, LG, um, mm -hmm. when all that sighty stuff went down, uh, Pau Ferro was harvested in um, large quantities uh, to make musical instruments. And now that the CITES thing has been lifted, um, my guess is they are not going to harvest the Pau Ferro in such large quantities, and you may see that um, getting regulated back to uh, sort of a side note like it was before as Rosewood comes back. That's my prediction. Uh, when that will start to happen, I have no idea. Um, so for now, we are Pau Ferro. Team Pau Ferro. Because we dig it. Uh, Can I couple more questions? couple more questions. Harry says... Harry Styles? No, damn it. I can't say his last name. Okay. But it's not Styles. All right then. <laughs> it says P90 and humbucker pickup configuration. Can that produce a heavy rock sound? Yeah, man. Without a doubt. Uh, P90 all by itself has made some of the greatest heavy rock sounds there are. Think of uh, Joan Jett, man, and that those old uh, SG specials and juniors and stuff. I, I mm -hmm. mean, you can, you you can crank P90 and get great rock sounds through it. Um, a lot of people don't like the hum associated with the P90 and the bridge pickup, even though they do like that sort of mid-range spike. Uh, so, which is why we make the double agent and the six-gun HPP, uh, and and just relegate the P90 to the neck position. Um, and then, of course, don't forget to check out the ever popular. Railhammer Huevos 90 pickup. If you are looking for the best of both worlds, plug, shameless plug, the uh, Heavy 90 and the Nuevo 90 uh, pickups are uh, humbucker sized uh, replacement pickups that are wired to tonally have the mid ring punch of a P90, but there is no hum and they will drop right into the bridge of any humbucker clipped car and destroy. Mm. I use them. And somebody named Jason Bose. Never heard of that person. Yeah, right. Since you seem to be talking a lot about finishes and colors today, would you do a full natural grain Karina finish for a base, kind of like the old P90 
PBT40s. Yes, Jason. Um, go check out your Thunder Gun. Jason, <laughs> Jason has the Thunder Gun prototype that is in uh, natural Karina. We have done um, nat all natural Karina Thunder Guns off and on for many, many years. Currently, I think it's only coming in gunmetal. Um, but that is the, the all Karina guitar is super bad looking, um, as evidenced by, and by bad I mean badass, as evidenced by this sweet cross cut behind me. This is a natural Karina body. So this is Karina that's just been cleared, um, and it's gorgeous. And we have done bases in this. Uh, I don't know what is, I don't think we have one currently in line. And if we don't, you're right, we should. Uh, and he likes his descent, by the way. Excellent. Mr. Bose came down here and got a descent a couple weeks ago, red burst one. Those descents are fun to play around with. Um, and on the short scale thing, a lot of bass players are chiming in about why they like a short oh, cool. scale. I love it. Uh, I'll read the thread later. Yeah. You know, they do like the punchier tone. A lot of them play these long gigs where they have to play fast, and that so it helps. All that. Yeah, all that. Kick ass. Mm -hmm. Thanks for chiming in. Thank you, everyone. Um, everybody have a terrific weekend. What do we got coming up, LG? We're you not have, really sure. You have a gig in a month. Oh, I have a gig. Polka Floyd Show is back June 6th. It's a Sunday. We're playing in downtown Pennsylvania. Yep. And then, and then June 11th. I don't know what that is. Twins. Right? Oh my gosh, the Zimmerman twins are going to be playing at the Village Idiot Mommy. I can't wait to do a show. It's going to be so much fun. Two shows. I know, that is two shows. Right. And then, uh, and then, yeah, and so we, and so hopefully the Zimmerman twins will get on a sort of semi regular thing around here again. That would be awesome. Uh, great, I had great rehearsal with those guys this week. We got a, we're doing a lot of stuff. It's awesome. I was in the studio yesterday with the traders getting new stuff ready. We have gigs booked for the fall, including a huge festival where I will see my friend Tim Carnes mm -hmm. uh, down in Virginia Beach. That's true. And uh, a bunch of other stuff going on. So there's things to pay attention to. I will be back here next week, same time, same place. LG and I, we're out of here. We're going to get some lunch and yep. we're going to figure something out to do this afternoon, right? That's for so sure. Much, so much to do around here. See everybody next week. Have a terrific weekend. Yeah. Oh, that was my uh, that was my little. You like that? You like that little noise that got put in that loop? Okay. everybody